I just want to bless him. You know what? He lost his wife not too long ago. Hasn't been, it's been almost a year. And I know one day he's going to be together again with her. And uh, he'll stroll over heaven with her. If I surveyed all the good things that come to me from above, if I count all the blessings from the storehouse of love, I'd simply ask for the favor of him beyond mortal kin. And I'm sure that he'd grant it again. I want to stroll over heaven with you some glad day where all our troubles and heartaches are vanished away and we'll enjoy the beauty where all things are new i want to stroll over heaven with you so many places of beauty we long to see here below but time and treasures have kept us from making plans as you know but come the morning of the rapture together we'll stand anew while i stroll over heaven with you I want to stroll over heaven with you some glad day where all our troubles and heartaches are vanished away and we'll enjoy the beauty where all things are new. I want to stroll over heaven with you. Someday I'll stroll over heaven with you. Amen. Turn to Joshua chapter 1. We'll be in Joshua, so make sure you keep your place. Forgot to say that last time, so... And I didn't keep my own place, which has just made the sermon that much longer. You got out at noon, brother. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's not too bad for Baptists, huh? Then we start a little bit earlier. We're going to be looking at Joshua chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people saying pass through the host and command the people saying prepare you victuals victuals for within three days ye shall pass over this jordan to go in to possess the land which the lord your god giveth you to possess it and to the reubenites and to the gadites and to the tribe or the half tribe of manasseh spake joshua saying Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God have given you rest and have given you this land. Your wives and your little ones and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of Jordan. But ye shall pass before your brethren armed, all the mighty men of valor, and help them, until the Lord have given you bre your brethren rest as he have given you. And they also have possessed the land which, your Lord, which the Lord your God giveth them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you on this side of Jordan toward the sun rising. And they answered Joshua, saying, All that thou commandest us, we will do. And whithersoever thou sendest us, we will go. According as we have hearkened unto Moses in all things, so will we hearken unto thee. Only the Lord thy God be with thee, as he was with Moses." Whosoever he be that doth re rebel against thy commandment and will not hearken unto thy words and all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death. Only be strong and of a good courage. 
Father, Lord, I just pray, to God, that you just uh, fill me up with your spirit, Lord, and speak through me. Give me the words that you'd want the congregation to hear, Lord. And I just pray that everybody's heart would just be able to receive what is preached. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the previous verses, verses 2 through 9, what we went through this morning, Joshua received instruction from God. This is instruction concerning the children of Israel and where they're to go from here. They just lost their leader. They just lost Moses. And now they have a new leader, a man who was a servant, a humble, very humble beginning. And God chose this man to, to take the place of, uh, of their great leader, Moses. When we're in that similar situation right now, our pastor, he's going to be gone for a while here. Um, and he's going to be going down to the tropical area down there in the tropics. And I'm not sure exactly where else. I think he said he's going to Africa and all that. Um, but right now we're looking for a pastor. We're looking for a preacher. And I know that God has somebody for us. Just like he had David ready to be the king of Israel. He, he had that little shepherd boy ready and set up. He had somebody for us. And I don't think that we need to worry. I don't think that we, we need to start looking for another church. I, I know that there's some people that are getting discouraged and they're probably thinking, oh, we haven't even had anybody candidate yet. And, oh, I don't know. I think I'm going to find a different church. Well, shame on you. Just be patient. Wait on the Lord. He's going to provide. He will. Just like he provided Israel with Joshua. He was a great leader. And you know what? He went very, he went much farther than Moses ever did or could go. And I told you earlier this morning that he is that representation of Jesus Christ. The problem with a lot of preachers nowadays, though, are they're, they're not men that can get alone with God and receive proper instruction. They're distracted. They're distracted men. And some of these men... They've been distracted ever since they left uh, Bible school or seminary. They're not students of the Bible. And in, in a lot of these seminaries across this world, it's sad to say, especially in the United States, they're teaching people and young preachers at a very young age to doubt the Bible and to correct the Bible. And we just got a bunch of Bible correctors coming out of these schools with no power, no power from God. Oh, they might have talent. They might, they might be good speakers but they don't have the power of God. And a lot of times you're just going to hear the same messages over and over. It's just going to be nothing but salvation messages, nothing but tithing, nothing but church attendance or whatever. It's just going to be the same thing over and over, and you don't really ever grow. The whole congregation is starving out because they're not getting the word of God because the man of God doesn't know how to get alone. He doesn't know how to get alone in God's word and meditate on it and, and, and grow himself strong, spiritual, so he can help others grow and he can teach others and instruct others in the way of righteousness. This is a big problem. I mean, we're, we're, we're hungry for the word and we're not getting it. And I just pray whoever comes into this pulpit is a student of the Bible, knows the word of God front and back, can teach, apt to teach. That's what we want. That's part of the qualifications of a preacher, of, of a bishop. Let them be apt to teach. Somebody who doesn't have any ability to teach does not belong up there in, in that pulpit. It's a big book right here we got. 66 books. And how seldom do we really dive into that book and actually go through it and teach it chapter by chapter and verse by verse. That's why I really like expository preaching and I really gravitate towards that. I really get, uh, gravitate towards the style of like how Brother Ryber goes through uh, expository preaching. He'll go through a chapter of the Bible, and sometimes it might take us a few months. But wow, if you don't just totally glean and really, you're absorbed in it. We've been living there in John chapter 12 for three months. And it's just been in my heart and in my mind, and I've been meditating on it and chewing on it and thinking about it all the time. And that's the kind of stuff we need. We don't just need a bunch of flashy preachers. We don't need a bunch of theatrics. We don't need a bunch of jokes. We don't need a bunch of uh, funny stories or great anecdotes. Um, my brother and I were talking about that, just all the you know different anecdotes. And I don't have a lot of those. And I don't even know if I'm saying it right, anecdotes or whatever. A lot of illustrations. Maybe they'll come to me with time. But 
I got a book full of illustrations here. I got this King James Bible. And if you just read that book, God's got illustrations all the way through the thing. I don't have to tell you a bunch of stories. Uh, I hope I don't have to tell you a bunch of these, these kind of stories that keep your attention. Can't you just hear the word and pay attention to that? Isn't that enough? After he got that message, his job was to relay the message. And in this instance, in verse number 11, he relayed the message, excuse me, verse 10, Joshua commanded the officers of the people saying, he didn't just go and he actually speak it to the people in this instance. He actually delegated the authority, he said, to the officers of the people saying, pass through the hosts and command the people saying, prepare you victuals or vittles. I don't know, there's different ways of pronouncing it. That's provisions. That's food. That's water. Why? Because there's three days journey. They're going to be going over into, uh, into that promised land. And they need to be prepared for it. And he used the men of the church to do that. I'm going to call it the church. In the Old Testament, it was actually referred to as a church at maybe one or two spots. Now, it's not the body of Christ like w what we are. They weren't sealed with the Holy Spirit like we are until the day of redemption. But they were a body and they were a congregation. They were a, a, a group of people. And uh, I just thank God that Joshua, he wasn't an ego, egotistical man. He wasn't a man that was so prideful that he said, oh, no, I, I'll tell them all. I'll walk through. I'll tell every person if I have to. It takes me all night. No, he delegated authority. And I'm glad that we have a church like that where we have men that can come up here and speak. And that's just a blessing to me. And it's nice, too, to hear a variety. I, I enjoy hearing everybody. It doesn't matter if you've got a great projecting voice or if you're quiet or what. Can you give me something from the word? That's what I'm looking for. That's all I want. Just, just teach us the word. Spend some time with God. Get alone with God. And, and we got that responsibility, some of us in this church. And I, I, I just want everybody to be ready. Be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within you. I like that my brother, he's got a message and he's got it in, uh, I think it's in first or second Kings and, uh, he keeps it with him. I think it's in his Bible right now. Even if somebody was to call on him to, to come up and teach or preach, he's already ready. And that's what the Lord expects from us. We ought to be ready. This is a day and age of deception. And right now in this day and age, we need to beware of false, false brethren trying to bring you dry and moldy bread. Here they're passing out bread. They're passing out the provisions for this journey. But there is a such thing as false doctrine. And I know that we're not, we don't have our head in the sand. We know it exists. Just talk to anybody who claims to be a Christian. And a lot of times you, they go to different churches, whatever. You're going to hear a lot of weird stuff come out of their mouth. Sometimes I want to invite them people to church, but I want to be somewhat careful who I'm inviting. That's all we need is some, some kind of person that's going to bring division. Who, you can tell some of these people that all they want to do is argue and all that. Is that really what we want in here? Is it really all about numbers? Do we want numbers for the sake of possibly getting a church split because somebody's going to bring some kind of weird doctrine in here? That's why we got Baptists on the name. Baptist ain't going to get you to heaven. If that's all you got, then you're lost. Sorry. If all you are is a Baptist, that, that, that's going to get you nowhere. But Baptist kind of draws a line in the sand, and, and they know, a lot of people know, oh, you're a Baptist? Oh, you stand for this. You, you're, you're a fundamentalist. We, we believe in the fundamentals of the faith. We, we, faith. we believe in the vicar, vicarious atonement. We believe in the death, burial, and resurrection. We believe in the millennial reign. We believe we're pre-tribulation. We believe that pre-tribulation rapture. We don't believe that we're going to go through the wrath of God. That's a time of Jacob's trouble, not of, not of the church's trouble. But it's good to know this and to have this up at our church. We're Baptist church. Why? If we're just going to take that down and say, you know what, we got a new pastor and what the new pastor says, you know what, we don't want to be called Baptist anymore. Amen. You know, we don't want to be offensive. We don't want to offend people before they even get in here. Yeah, well, you know what? You're going to start getting a lot of the wrong people in here. Right. 
you might get some woman in there trying to, you know, tongue flap and speak tongues and all this stuff and roll around, roll around on the ground and bark like a dog. This kind of stuff goes on. We don't need that in here. We don't want that. We don't want disorder. Tongues was a gift. It was a sign given. But that sign was given in order for Jews to come to Jesus Christ. There was a lot of Jews from different nations when that miracle of tongues first happened. And it was a sign. It says that the Jews, that Israel seeks after a sign. Why are we in the church seeking signs? We don't need that sign, that tongue sign. That tongue sign was for that early church to get going, to the Jew first and then also to the Gentile. But when the, man, when the preacher spoke, when the disciples spoke, they all heard them in their own tongue, in their own language. It was more of a miracle of ears than it was a miracle of what he was saying. He was speaking probably his own language, but what they were hearing, all these different men from different, different places, they were hearing their, their language. Wow, how is he speaking? And we, we're hearing them in our own native tongues. He broke down, God broke down what took place over at Babylon, that, that confusion of tongues. That's tongues. All this Fred Barney Wilma, yabba dabba doo, yabba dabba doo, all this kind of stuff that goes on, that is not of God. You know what that is? That's the carnal mind. That's, look at me, look at me, I'm spiritual. Oh, oh, you're saved, but have you got the filling of the Holy Spirit? Have you spoken tongues? And I've heard that. I've been out in the streets in San Diego, and I've had people all the time, they come out of the woodworks. You're dealing with a lost sinner who's curious about the Lord, wants to get saved, and all of a sudden, here comes some baddie lady, and they're trying to get you to speak in tongues, trying to get the person that's not even saved yet to speak in tongues. I said, would you get out of here, please? I appreciate it if you just keep walking. I, I'm not trying to get people to speak in tongues. I want people to realize that they're sinners in need of a Savior, that Jesus Christ died on the cross, shed his precious blood in their place, and he made an atonement for their sins. They don't have to be slaves of their sins anymore. But you're always going to have, the devil always has somebody to go in there and try to get you off track. And then you're going to start arguing with them. And all of a sudden, the sinner kind of just walks off. They're everywhere. And that, and that tongues is nothing but that. All it is is a show. Look at me, I'm spiritual. No, you're not. You're carnal. That's something that was going on in, the, uh, in Corinthians, in the, in the Corinthian church. The most carnal church in all the Bible. They, they got their act together in 2 Corinthians. But in 1 Corinthians, wow, they were very carnal. I, I don't even want to go through it all, but... Why would you model your church after that church? Why would you try to hang out doctrinally and try to, you know, the things that were, they were being rebuked for, why would you make that your focus? I, I think that's crazy. That's pure craziness to me. But they don't care. They just want a feeling. I felt something. I've heard that. I have family members that would say that. I don't care what the Bible says. I felt something. I felt the spirit. I felt the spirit. Yeah. Try the spirits and see whether they be of God. You're supposed to. You're commanded to. You're supposed to judge all things. He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. If you're not judging the spirits, you're, you're disobedient. How do you judge them? According to the word of God. If you don't know your Bible, how are you going to make judgments like that? How are you going to know what spirit's overtaking you? tell you if, you, if you get loose enough and you just keep singing the same verses over and over and over, the same words over and over, Jesus, oh, and they just, you know, they just keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over. It's, it's like hypnotism. It's going to make you kind of lose control of yourself. And all of a sudden you're going to get full of something, some spirit, some spirit's going to come in there, but it ain't the Holy Spirit. And also, another thing, just about, about those Pentecostals and all that, everything's about the Spirit. Oh, I'm filled with the Spirit, the Spirit, 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 Spirit. And that's fine and dandy, but I'm telling you, the Spirit is going to point to Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God wants to push you towards Jesus. And if the Spirit doesn't speak of himself, but that's all you hear in those churches. Okay, and moving on. A little bit of a rabbit trail. I'm good for that. Joshua chapter 9, verse 1. But keep your place over in Joshua 1. See, I'm getting better at that, brother. My brother told me that. He's like, yeah, you should tell them, like, you know, to keep their place. 
I said, yeah, that is, that makes sense. Man, I got this Dake Bible up here, and I didn't use that. I used my Schofield this morning, but this is a really big Bible. But it's got super, super thin pages, and it's really, really hard to turn through it. Um, but it's interesting where I got this Bible. When I was in the Navy, um, I stood out like a sore thumb, and I was trying to be uh, pecul- peculiar. I want to be a peculiar person for Jesus Christ. And I was a gunner's mate and everything, and, you know, people would kind of laugh and make fun of me sometimes, and, you know, like, oh, they call me Preacher. That was my nickname. But then I went to another, ch- uh, not another church, <laughs> I went to another ship, and uh, one, of my, one of my bosses, he, I guess he was watching me, and I didn't know that, but they watch you close, you know, they're always watching you, and he kind of pulled me aside one time in his office, and he was telling me, he goes, man, Josh, uh, I give you a hard time a little bit sometimes about the Bible and all that, but he said, I'm a believer, I, I believe, and I, and I take that kind of lightly. I don't know for sure if he really is or not, but maybe he is. Maybe he was just a closet Christian, you know, and he says, I wanted to see what you were made of, and I would try to lead you astray just to see if you would give in, because I've seen so many people come through here as all the time I've been in the Navy, and they talk like you and everything, but it ain't but a few months or something until we, we get them all laughing and telling dirty jokes and, and being just like everybody else. And he says, and you, you didn't do that. And he says, I really admire that about you. And uh, I, I don't remember how it came up, but we were talking about the Bible. And I mentioned that I had a really good Bible that I lost. And this was a wide margin Bible I got from Brother Don Green's church. And it was really marked up and really getting worn out real fast as a young Christian. And it's, it's amazing, though, when you're used to your Bible and you flip through it and you know on what side on the left side is going to be on or it's going to be in this column, you know where to look, and it makes it so much easier to find things. This is like more before, you know, we were really Googling everything and, and all the search engines and all this stuff. So it was really important for me to help, help me to find where I'm at, you know. Anyways, I lost my Bible. I had it in the birthing, which is, in other words, where you sleep. It was a birthing area. And they were working on the ship, and then I went over to the barge, and they, they boarded it up and all that. And I don't know if maybe a worker that was working on the ship might have grabbed it. I'm hoping somebody got a blessing and maybe out of my notes or whatever, too, in it. And I'm like, well, you know, it, it was a good Bible. I had it. And this brother, he told me, he goes, you know what? I want to buy you a Bible. And then he told me what kind of Bible. He's like, wait, what, what kind of Bible do you like and all that? And I was like, well, uh, I, I like the Dake Bible. You know, it's a King James Bible, but it's his refer- his uh, notes in it. And he paid for a Bible for me, and he bought me a really, really nice, expensive Bible. And he even said, I want to put, like, engraved on it what you want. And, uh, and uh, Joshua Govitz is on there, and a Star of David. And he put that on there for me. And I just think that's a blessing. But see, people are looking. They're watching you, and they want to see if you're real. Chapter 9, verse 1. And we're going to go through fi- uh, to 15. We're going to kind of read a lot. I'm going to try to read a little bit quick. And it came to pass when all the kings which were on this side, Jordan, in the hills and in the valleys and in the coasts of the great sea over Lebanon, the Hittite and the Amorite, the Can- Can- uh, Canaanite and Pezzarite, the Hivite and the Jebusite heard thereof, that they gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua, with Israel, with one accord. And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done at Jericho and then the Ai, they did work wily. That's like the devil there. He's, he's, he's uh, subtle. He's wild, wily like that. Excuse me. And went and made as if they had been ambassadors and took old sacks upon their asses and wine bottles, old and rent and bound up. And old shoes clouded upon their feet and old garments upon them, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua under the camp at Gilgal, and said unto him and to the men of Israel, We be come from a far country. Now therefore make a league with us. And the men of Israel said unto the Hivites, Peradventure, ye dwell among us, and how shall we make a league with you? And they said unto Joshua, We are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, Who are ye, and from whence come ye? Those are good questions. Some of that stuff we ought to ask people when they come in here. I mean, I'm not saying badger a, a visitor as soon as they come in with all that, you know. But if they start hanging around a little bit. 
And they said unto him, From a very far country thy servants are come because of the name of the Lord thy God, for we have heard the fame of him and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond Jordan, to Sihon, king of Hespon, or Heshbon, and to Og, king of Bashan, which was at Ashtaroth. Wherefore our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spake to us, saying, Take victuals, or victuals, victuals, I don't know how to say that word, with you for the journey, and we go to meet them, and say unto them, We are your servants, therefore now make, a, uh, make ye a league with us. This our bread we took hot, and that's a lie, for our provision out of the houses uh, uh, on the day we came forth to go unto you. But now, behold, it is dry and moldy. And these bottles of wine which we filled were new, and behold, they be rent. And these are garments, and our shoes are become old by reason of the very long journey. And the men took their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them to let them and the princes of the congregation swear unto them. I want to bring to your attention verse 11. Wherefore, our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spake to us, saying, Take victuals with you for the, con or for the journey, and go to meet them, and say unto them, We are your servants, therefore now make ye a league with us. What does it say? The elders and all the inhabitants of our country spake to us, saying, Take victuals. That sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Doesn't that sound just like Joshua chapter 1? What we were just reading there, Joshua commanded the officers of the people. These are the people uh, like, like, that he delegated the authority to. And he said, pass through the hosts and command the people, saying, prepare you fiddles, for within three days you'll pass over. Look at how the devil tries to replicate, how the devil tries to mimic what, what the church is doing. They're very sneaky. The devil's, that's the way he comes. He's like a, a roaring lion, but he's very subtle. In the garden, he was subtle. And he's still subtle. And, and sometimes we got to be careful of who, who come through these doors and what they're bringing. What kind of doctrine are they bringing? Are they bringing moldy bread? Or are they bringing good bread? And, and it's amazing. Like it, it, They went through a lot making everything look old. Their clothing and all this stuff. I mean, their shoes and everything were probably the leather was worn out about like Brother Ray's Bible. I've seen when he was up here. I mean, his Bible, praise the Lord, it's, it's so wore out, but that, there's a man that you know who he's a man of the Bible. He's in that book. Yeah. Amen. So in that sense, that we ought to be like them. In that. <laughs> and also, look at verse 14. And the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. Uh-oh. You're not asking counsel of the Lord now and you're taking what, what these strangers are giving you? But it turns out, they find out later on that, that these men deceived them and that they are Canaanites. They dwell in the land of Canaan. And sometimes our flesh will come to us when we're starting to get our uh, victories over certain sins. They'll come through real sneaky and they'll reintroduce themselves into your life. And, and, and if you're not careful, if you're not seeking counsel of the Lord, you might just take what they give you. And you might just start falling into the same sins that you thought you whipped a long time ago. But there they are. They snuck back in when you, when you weren't paying attention, when you, you weren't meditating in the Word. You weren't, uh, you weren't getting a hold of God and spending your time in the Bible like you should. And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them to let them live. And the princes of the congregation swear unto them. I just want to say that each individual's responsibility to enter this life lies in the following three things. It lies in the Bible, reading the Bible, studying it, and prayer, and church attendance, and, and, and fellowship. This is a system of checks and balances designed by God to make a saved man or woman go from being carnally minded to being spiritually minded. Well, how so is it going to do that? Well, if a man is very, very into the Bible, which is a good thing, but they're not into prayer and they don't pray that much. And this is something I think that I struggle with. You may start getting things from the Bible and you're sincere and you're really spending maybe hours in the Bible a day. 
but you might get off into left field or you might get off into right field and not in the middle where God wants you. Why? Because you're not prayed up or you're not in fellowship. And then you might come in here and you start telling people of the new doctrine you just learned and people will listen. But God has put people in here to keep you in check. And they might say, hey, brother, I appreciate your Bible study and all that, but have you ever thought about this? And have you looked at these verses here? It seems to contradict what you're trying to teach. And if you've got a humble heart, you're, you're going to be corrected by that, brother. There's, a, there's a wisdom in a multitude of counsel, the Bible says. So that's why we need to be here. Otherwise, you're going to be so full of your own ways and, and think you're right about everything. When I was street preaching with uh, Brother Reuben, I didn't talk to this man, but I've seen him over to the side talking for a long time to a man. And this guy, he actually believed, uh, Reuben said that he was like sinless perfection. He never sinned, I don't know how long. Usually they always say it's like 1983 or something, like some kind of way back there, you know. But this guy doesn't sin no more, he said. And uh, he said that he spends a lot of time in the Bible, and he seemed like he knew the Bible, and he quoted the Bible and all that. But he thought he was the only one that's right. And he said, everything I believe in the Bible is right. Every single thing that I, that I say is right in the Bible. Wow, what an ego. What a carnally minded person. Can't get along with anybody. Doesn't go to church. And then he started criticizing Reuben, saying, well, that's why I don't go to church and blah, blah, blah. And he says, you know what? Your problem is you're too much Baptist. You're, all, you're, you're Baptist and this and that. But that guy's problem is he can't fellowship with anybody. Ain't nobody straight enough for him. He's the only one that's right. He said that, Reuben said, he told, told him that 97% of people that claim to be saved are lost. And he said that uh, anybody that goes to a denomination or belongs to a denomination is lost. He said, oh, you're deceived. That's those internet guys that just want to make a name for themselves. You got to be careful. I mean, there's a lot of good preaching, a lot of good stuff on the internet and on YouTube and all this stuff. But there's a lot of whack jobs on there, too. And, and if you know your word, you're going to spot them pretty quick. I'm not saying that some stuff, nobody's going to, you're not going to agree with everybody on everything. Not everybody's right about everything in this book. There's a lot of stuff that I'm, I may be wrong on and that you may be wrong on. But that's why God put us here to, in church, so we can help each other out. Um, but you just got to be really careful when you're listening to some of these preachers. Now, I, I'm not saying that as soon as you hear something that you don't agree with, oh, I'm not listening to that guy. Because you're going to be like that, that guy on the streets. But as you grow in maturity, you should be able to have grace. And you should be able to eat the meat and spit out the bones. I like John MacArthur. I've been listening to him. And I always said, I'd never listen to anybody that's not King James. Bless God, anybody that's not King James. He, he preaches out of different versions of the Bible. I don't like it at all, really. And when he says something out of a certain version, I say it in my mind. Oh, no, this is the King James way, you know. And... I, I, I don't understand in a way that somebody that knows the word of God so good can be off on that. Like, how are you off track on that? To me, I feel like that's uh, kindergarten. That's baby stuff. Knowing what Bible is the right Bible, that's kindergarten. But I can't deny how much I learn from his uh, expository preaching and teaching. He lets the Bible do all the talking. And, and I'm getting a lot out of him. I've been listening to him. But uh, I just take the meat and I spit out the bones. But I don't recommend that for everybody. You know, there's some preachers or some people, uh, maybe commentaries or books. I would like to recommend to a young Christian, but I probably wouldn't do it. Reason why is because they're not grounded in the word enough and they might get uh, sent off to the right, too far to the right or too far to the left. Dake is like that. Dake's got, I mean, he knew the Bible just about better than anybody. And he's got the biggest, uh, what do you call it? Notes and all that. He's got more notes than anybody in that Bible. But he's got a lot of kind of weird things. See, I think he was a Pentecostal or something. Um, but he believed kind of a lot of weird things. And you know what the problem was with Dake? Probably a lack of prayer. Probably a lack of prayer. He probably was, spent so much time in the Bible, but he got all mucked up, messed up on his uh, doctrine. Why? Because he wasn't praying. I tell you, it's very, very important. Three things. Church. Fellowship. We need to be in church. We need to be fellowshipping. We can't say, oh, I'm an island to myself. I'm going to be a great Christian, and I'm just going to sit there and watch 
Charles Stanley on TV every morning. You're not going to. It's not going to work. God didn't design it that way. And then you got to be in prayer. You got to be receiving, you got me, excuse me, you got to be speaking to the Lord and then he speaks back to you through the word. He set it up that way. Three things. Oh, what a coincidence. Trinity. Three things. He didn't make it very hard. Just three things. I, I remember my old pastor, Pastor Nagowski over in uh, Clarkston, and he always used to ask people if they were messed up and they'd come up to him, oh, pastor, I got problems. Oh, you don't know what's happening and all this. And he would always ask them right away, are you praying? Are you reading your Bible? Are you going to church? Every time. And that one of those things was missing, or if not all three of them. And that's why they got the problems. That's why all those problems arise, because they're carnally minded. If you're spiritually minded, it's a whole different story. Um, I just want to speak again and just say about the men of leadership positions who teach Sunday school, who get to preach from time to time in this church. I just think that we need to uh, spend time in our Bibles and we got to be ready to feed and protect. Uh, and, and don't just leave it all up to the pastor, but help him to protect everybody in here from spiritual deception. Because right now we're in the last days and spiritual deception is on an all time high. There's people now that are, you know, they're King James and they, they said the devil probably thought, well, that's a good way to get to these King James Bible believers. So they got people, uh, uh, like what's his name? Steven Anderson. He don't believe in repentance and he's a King James only guy and all that. He's got a lot of other weird things, but he's a very carnally minded, very hateful sound in person. Um, and they, there's a lot of them. The devil's he's in, infiltrating the church and we got to guard ourselves. And I just thank God for, for men like brother Ryber who spends time and you know, he's in that book and I don't, I don't want to be deceived and I don't want nobody else to be deceived. And I know he doesn't. And God's blessed him. And I tell you, that our Sunday school, I don't, I don't think they'd be quick to be deceived by anybody. What a blessing. Look at Matthew chapter 14, verse 13. We're going to go to verse 21. When Jesus heard of it, he departed, thence by a ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past, and the multitude, or send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves fiddles. That's why that's important. we got to have those same words. It makes it easy to uh, cross-reference. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart. Give ye them to eat. Why, why are you sending them away? we got everything right here that we need. we got God manifest in the flesh. He's the bread of life. And they said unto him, We have here Jesus. No, they said we have here <laughs> but five loaves and two fishes. And he, uh, he said, bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass. Just makes me think of uh, Joshua over there in chapter 1. And took the five loaves and the two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake, and gave the loaves to who? His disciples. Just like Joshua did. He said, here, men, some of the men that are higher up in, uh, in leadership positions, feed these people. And, his, and the disciples, oh, excuse me, I lost my spot. And break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up of the fragments that remained 12 baskets full. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Look at all these people that got fed. And they got fed by what? People that were ready to serve God. And we need to always be ready to serve in here. To, to feed those, and that's even in fellowship, in the fellowship hall out there. People are hungry. Sometimes people really want to talk about the Bible, and I, and I hope you don't want to talk about something else. Like I was saying earlier, you want to talk about sports or something else. Don't, don't, cha don't change the subject on 
somebody that wants to talk about the Bible. Please don't do that. Not here. If you do that somewhere else, okay, but don't try not to do that here. Some people actually want to learn and want to grow and like to have fellowship about, over the Bible. And don't, don't discourage them from that. Look at Romans chapter 13 and verse 14. big old Bible. <laughs> it's, it's a tough one. But that's where I spent most of my time when I was studying this. And then when I went to the other one, my other smaller Bible, it's funny, it just didn't look the same to me. Like I wasn't looking in the same spots and everything. So I'm like, you know what, I might as well just bring this one. I feel a little more comfortable with it on this. Uh, Romans 13 and verse 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. This is something that God commanded. Joshua was over there. Jesus, uh, excuse me, Joshua, like Jesus, commanded the children of Israel to do something. And you know what? In the Bible here in Romans, this is uh, written by Paul. He's commanding. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. When Where did he get this from? He got this from Jesus Christ. He got this from Joshua, from Jesus Christ. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Every day you're going to have to die to yourself. You're going to have to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to have to make that decision. I, am I going to be carnally minded today? See, it'd be nice if, like I was saying earlier, that we can go down to the altar and get just so full of God that we don't have to ever stop and get another refill. But every single day your tank's going to run dry. Every single day it's going to be a new battle. This is a place when they go to is or excuse me when they go to Canaan land, it's a place of battle. There's a place of giants, um, and unbelief kept them from going there. But I'm telling you, if you're going to go into to spirit filled life, you're going to do battle. But you got to be willing to put on the whole armor of God, put on the whole, uh, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and His righteousness, and and do battle every single day. Also at the, at the bottom there uh, of that verse, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. We need to stop doing things that's premeditated. A lot of times, you know, they talk about premeditated murder and all this kind of stuff. How much sore of the crime of our sins when we premeditate them? We need to quit putting things in the way that causes us to sin and causes us to stumble. If you got things in your house that is causing you to sin and stumble or is bringing back old memories or whatever, or you got maybe a Facebook account or something and you got a friend on there that you used to date back in high school or something and you're married and all of a sudden you're getting tempted and you're starting to talk to this person, you need to get rid of that. These temptations that you got in your life is going to cause you to fall, it's going to cause you to stumble. This is, part of, this is part of that walk. This is part of that life in the Christian life that God expects of you. He wants you to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, but he also wants you to not make provisions for the flesh. And that's why we keep sinning a lot of times. You know, it's, it's hard not to fulfill a sin when you've already been thinking about that sin all day or because something around you is, is, is sparking it in you, you know? It says that uh, when seed is, or excuse me, when Sin is sown, and when it, when it conceives, it brings forth sin. There's a conception, just like giving birth, just like when we're birthed in the family of God. There's bad seed that's getting in there, and sometimes it, it gets birthed in our lives, and then we end up sinning. Why? Because we were letting these provisions for the flesh be in our house, or we're not taking care of these things. We should take, them, take some things out and burn them, you know? Get rid of it. If it's holding you back... If something's holding you back from being a spirit-filled Christian and living that life that God wants and having that rest, obtaining that rest, get rid of it. Get it out of your life. Now we're going back to Joshua. I hope you kept your spot. I didn't, but while I was flipping other stuff, I was trying to flip back to that at the same time. <laughs> the Bible says that 
ye shall pass over. Now I'm missing my spot. Verse 12. Excuse me, verse 11. Pass through the host and command the people, saying, Prepare ye vittles, for within three days ye shall pass over this Jordan. Ye shall pass over. If you do make the right spiritual provisions and avoid the carnal ones, ye shall pass over and enter into God's rest. This is a promise. You can trust God. We trust him for salvation. That's the funny thing. We trust God with our eternal souls. But how come we don't trust God with our day-to-day lives? We trust God 100%. I'm going to live in heaven 100% sure. I know, I'm, I know he keeps his promises. But why don't we believe in the promises of God according to the spirit-filled life? Why do we doubt him in this? Those children of Israel believed enough to get out of Egypt, and then they were in that wilderness, and they were wandering around, but they didn't go in. Why? The Bible says because of unbelief. Unbelief kept them back. They had enough faith and enough belief, the measure of faith, to get saved, but they didn't have the faith and the belief to believe God to go into this Canaan land, and they were, they, you know, 40, 40 uh, years, a bunch of them, a whole generation of them died there in the wilderness. And they just murmured and complained. It's like our lives every day, you know, maybe go to work and go home and complain while you're at work. Go home, complain that the dishes weren't done. You know, put on something on Netflix, lay around. Maybe if you got time, every once in a while you might pop open your Bible and kind of look at a couple verses or, you know, kind of skim through it and hope God will just, oh, I'm going to flip it open and he's going to talk to me. You know, that kind of stuff. You know, half-hearted. Might say a little prayer over your meal. And go to bed, maybe a little quick little prayer, now I lay me down to sleep, all this kind of stuff. And then you, you might go to the gym and work out. But all it is is a, is a cycle. You just keep doing the same little things, watching TV, working out, saying your little prayers. Oh, getting your couple, maybe your little devotional, your Baptist bread, whatever. You got one little verse and that's all you got. But then you're missing a whole context. You might get a nice verse, but then really the meat of that verse and, and, and what God's really trying to to convey in that verse or trying to to show you is in the previous verse or previous verses the following verses and all that you're missing it because all i got is baptist bread and i oh i'm a spiritual giant i read the baptist bread every morning no you're not you're carnal you're carnally minded you're not going to grow and you're going to die in the wilderness you're going to be a complainer you might end up being a fornicator people can fornicate believe it or not that are saved and these are people that got out of uh, excuse me out of egypt out of, out of Pharaoh's mighty hand, he had a mighty hand on them, and, he, and they were bore down with sins, but all of a sudden they started getting these sins back in their lives. And what did they do? They rose up early to, to what? To play. God said, or excuse me, Paul said, when I became a man, I put away childish things. We need to put away childish things. I mean, there's a times where, I, like, of recent time, I'd get up and the first thing I want to do is play a video game or something like that. And that stuff's addicting. And I, I would think of that. Scriptures pop up in my head and they rose up to play, rose up early to play. Wow, what a shame. I was like, God could strike you dead for that. That's what he did. And, and the, that fear of God to keep his commandments, I, I'm all for that. Like Brother Adam preached. Hey, if, if that's all you got and you're, not, you're, you're a young Christian, obey those commands. They can keep you from a shipwreck they can keep you from really hurting yourself. They can keep you from totally uh, ruining your testimony before all your friends and your family. The law is good. But if you're spiritually minded, you don't need the law, but you will fulfill the law and you will do the law naturally because you're going to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. That law by Moses in verse 13. Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying... The Lord your God have given you rest and have given you this land. They're going to they're gonna fall short of this. Why? Because under the law, you can't get in. Look at verse 14. Your wives, your little ones. This is talking about the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you in verse 13. This wasn't commanded of Joshua. This was commanded of Moses. This is under the law. This is where these people wanted to dwell. They didn't want to go over. They found something with their eyes. They already saw, oh, we like this land. 
remind you of anybody when, when, when there was a choice to be made? Lot could have went with Abraham, but instead he saw the plains of uh, Sodom, and he saw how nice it was. And, oh, man, that would look like a good place to raise my family. It's amazing people move places without even knowing if there's a good Bible-believing church there before they go. Okay, in verse 14, Your wives, your little ones, and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of Jordan, but ye shall pass before your brethren armed, all the mighty men of valor, and help them. In verse 15, until the Lord have given your brethren rest as he have given you, and they, have, they also have possessed the land which the Lord your, uh, your God giveth them, then ye shall return into the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses the Lord's servant gave you on this side of Jordan towards the sun rising. These are people that went over and did battle, and I appreciate that, and I'm sure, you know, that, that's commendable. They went over there and they helped, I think it was like 40,000 of them. 40,000 soldiers out of 110,000 of them went over there and battled. But they wanted to live back in, in, in that spiritual bondage, really. It's still a bondage. Living under law is bondage. He said, curse it every man that, that, that doesn't go through and fulfill every bit of the law. And that's a miserable life. The carnal life of a Christian that's saved but doesn't want to be spirit-filled, doesn't want to walk into things of God, is very miserable. But this is what these people wanted. You know Why? Something was holding them back from going to that finish line. They're right there. They even crossed over, which even shows me that you can cross over in the spirit-filled life, but some people go back. What held them back? Your wives, your little ones, your cattle shall remain in the land. It, it was all about their material things. It was about their families. And a lot of times that holds you back. Sometimes it holds people back from even getting saved. And in the same sense, it holds people back from going even further with God in that deeper life. Oh, man, but if I, if I surrender everything, what if, what if God calls me to leave my job? Oh, I make $100,000 a year, and, oh, man, I don't want to give in like that. And then maybe your wife wants to, but you might be a wet blanket on her because I don't want to lose everything I got. And what if God demands more than I want to give? And they're afraid, unbelief. They don't believe God has something good for them. Oh, he's got heaven, but they don't want, they don't want none of that now. Well, they're going to remain over there. I had a couple of things I got from, uh, from my friend Matt, but I'm, I'm not going to go into them. I, I want to try to hurry up and wrap this up here. Sorry for the dead air. <laughs> We're almost done. Amen. So anyways, living on, living on the border is not going to help you. It's, it's not going to give you any kind of, really any peace. It might give you like a, a superficial enjoyment, but it's not going to be real. It's not real joy of being filled with the Spirit. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23. We don't want this guy up here no more. He takes too long. I'll wrap it up here soon. 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, against such there is no law. Ephesians 5.9. The fruit of the Spirit, I'm not going to have you turn there, but the fruit of the Spirit is in truth. And the Bible says, thy word is truth. We need to dwell in the truth. And in John 8, 31 through 32, the Bible talks about continuing in the word. If you continue in the word, then are you my disciples indeed. These people believed, in John chapter 8, they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They believed on him. They received salvation. But God said, if you're going to be my disciples, indeed, you have to be in the truth. You have to abide in the truth. And it says, in the truth, you shall know the truth. Who's that? Jesus. 
from reading this word, you'll know Jesus and you'll know who he is. We know him as our savior, but do we really know him? And it says, and then the truth will make you free. Get in the word and be disciples indeed. People, this world has enough saved people. They, they have enough of saved people. Oh yeah, your coworkers, you know, some of your coworkers, they're like, well, my so-and-so saved, they, they come here and they tell dirty jokes and they do this and they're lazy, they don't want to work and they show up late to work and we got enough of that. And it, people can be saved and be very carnal like that. And I've been, I've been that guy. They don't need that. What they need is disciples indeed. Be rooted and grounded in the word and be used of God. Be, be a light and shine to this lost world so they can see you and they can glorify God who's in heaven. And then lastly, in uh, Joshua 1, go back to Joshua 1. We're going to just fly through 16 and 18 and we're done. And they answered Joshua saying, all that thou commandest us, we will do. This is talking about the Reubenites and all that. We will do. And whithersoever thou sendest us, we will go. According as we hearken unto Moses in all things. Oh, wow, that's reassuring. Yeah, they really hearkened to Moses, didn't they? Oh, something that um, my brother told me is like, and I forgot to bring it up. You know what? Moses, they said that they feared Moses. They obeyed Moses. They followed after Moses. But nowhere that I've ever seen does it say that they love Moses. And you know what? And you can't love in the law. You're, you're going to be hateful towards others because they don't have the standards you got. Well, I, I don't even have a TV. Oh, they got a TV? Well, they ain't even right with God. Well, uh, you know, and you know what? And, and the only people you can get along with are the people in your house. And, and you're lucky if you can even get along with them because nobody else fits your standards. And you know what? You may appear, you think, oh, I'm a spiritual giant. I'm really spiritual. You're not. You're carnal. If you, if you got a bunch of standards and all that, but you don't know Jesus Christ... You're not, you're not spiritual. You're carnally minded. You're still, in, you're still over there wandering around in the wilderness. That's not spirit-filled life. Spirit-filled life is having grace with those people. Not everybody's going to have your same standards. There's a lot of stuff that's not clear-cut in the Bible. That, and it's good to have convictions and all that. But when you're trying to push all your convictions on people like a Pharisee, that's the carnal mind. That's not what we want. Verse 17. According as we hearken unto Moses in all things, so will we hearken unto thee. Only the Lord thy God be with thee, as he was with Moses. Whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment, and will not hearken unto thy words, and all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. That's what they were saying. He shall be put to death. Hey, if somebody doesn't obey, they, that's what they want. That's why they're staying there. That's why they're staying over there in, in, in that, on the other side of Jordan. They don't want to go over. You know why? They, they, they want to live in the law. Hey, if you, don't, if you don't do what I do and you're not just like me, may you die. May God strike you dead. Oh, man, you're so spiritual. I don't want to be like that. And I hope nobody in this church wants to be like that. I think we got a good spirit about us. I don't really ever detect anything like that in this church. And that's a real blessing. I, I mean, there's a lot of churches where you get a lot of that. Oh, look what she's wearing. Well, she's not supposed to wear pants or this or that. And... and all the things that God doesn't make a huge uh, emphasis on, they strain at a gnat and they swallow a camel. What, meanwhile, they're living in adultery. You know, and there's preachers like that too. There's preachers that are living in adultery and they, they sound spiritual up here, but they're carnally minded. We need to be spiritually minded people if we're ever to receive what God wants for us here. And then eventually we'll be in heaven and that transition won't be as drastic. That's what he wants. He wants our, our days of heaven on earth right now. We can live that way. Amen. And that's, and that's all we got. Father, Lord, I thank you, God, for your word. Thank you, God, for Joshua chapter 1 and for all the wisdom in there. There's so much in there, God, and I just thank you for blessing my heart from it. And I learned a lot of things. And I hope, Lord, that I was able to convey and uh, teach some truth, Lord, and people were able to receive it. And I didn't bore them too much, Lord. Um, and I just, I just pray that they take it home with them and that they really ponder and think about it, Lord, and that they just become students of the word and just really uh, be in the word, be in prayer, and, and be in church, Lord. And